This is going to be a reading of chapter 7 of the book called Jesus is the Tithe by Bertie Brits of Dynamic Love Ministries. Entering the Kingdom of God The most beautiful, most wonderful, life-giving kingdom has come to earth. It is the kingdom of the divine ones, available for all people. Yet we find that there are many not seeing nor experiencing the kingdom in their everyday lives. When I was living in my endless search for life, as explained in chapter 2, I thought I understood and was partaking of the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, I was even trying to advance the kingdom and see the church take over the world. I would get up early in the morning, binding the devil and demons, and declaring the kingdom of God over various towns in hopes that Christians would rise to high positions in government and other key offices. I wanted all people to come to our church so that they could enter the kingdom of God. I did everything a good Christian in the charismatic Pentecostal church world would do to promote the kingdom of God. I thought entering God's kingdom meant that people must confess their sins so God could forgive them, receive the Holy Spirit, and start winning souls through signs, wonders, and miracles. I saw myself as a kingdom worker and wanted all people to be as I was. The truth is, I was radically doing all these things with no clue of what the kingdom of God is really about. I couldn't see the kingdom, nor could I enjoy my life in it. My only understanding of God's kingdom that came anywhere close to what it actually is was that I believed I would be with him when I died because of the blood of Jesus and his love for me. Unfortunately, while I could see only this small glimpse of the kingdom, I was actually living in the kingdom of darkness, even though I was claiming everything in the name of Jesus. I was blinded by the love of money and driven by my zealous obedience to the methods for successful Christianity proposed by the latest revelation of key preachers. Truth be told, what I wanted most of all <clears throat> was to reach that place where God actually wanted me. But I was blinded by the law that was clothed in a Pentecostal charismatic cloak. <clears throat> I could not see the kingdom, nor could I enter it. I was as described in the beginning of this book, the noise of legalism drowned out the voice of my Abba. The kingdom of God is not characterized by how big your ministry is or how many get saved at your meetings. It is not about your prayers answered or having a healthy body or giving to the poor. As a matter of fact, the kingdom of God is not even determined by all people living holy. Even if everyone repented of sin and lived a good life, it still wouldn't mean that they would see the kingdom, that they see the kingdom and live in that which God really intended for us. Even if you could live perfectly sinless, that no, that is no indication that you have entered the kingdom of God. So how can we as humans experience the realm where the divine ones dwell? How do we enter Elohim's reality and the dynamics that encompass the Godhead? One of the best known verses in the Bible is found in the third chapter of John. It is so powerful and really worth studying in depth. By looking at verses 1 through 16, we realize how we can see and enter the kingdom of God. I will explain my understanding without elaborating too much. For a more detailed explanation, you can read my first book, Born from Innocence. Before I get into John 3.16, I need to explain the concept of birth found in John 1. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. According to this passage, we have the right to be called sons of God when we have received Jesus and we are those who are born of God. The best way I can translate these two verses is as following. All people, Jew or Gentile, that have grabbed a hold of Jesus, those that grabbed a hold of what his name really means as Savior, with the purpose to make use of him and what he concludes, and those who see what he accomplished as fully applicable to them have the authority to say the wonderful life they have and live originates from God and in his life and is his life. These are those whose minds are at rest, having full satisfaction in what he accomplished on behalf of mankind. 
They don't owe the birth of this wonderful new life they have and its manifestation in and through them to the fact that they are of a certain ethnic group, nor to willpower and obedience to commandments prescribed by Moses, nor to their craving for eternal life. They owe their birth, the life they possess in spirit and manifestation, to God birthing all he is and all he feels and enjoys into them, making what they have fully received God's authentic, um, what, making what they have fully received God authentic and not a man-made counterfeit of original life. When we are born from something, it has access to our lives and actually lives in and through us. If we look at a person, let's say a woman, who's been really hurt in an abusive relationship and living in the hurt for many years to follow, we can conclude that she owes her life to the hurt and abuse she suffered. The life she lives is a direct result of what she believes about the abuse. What she believes about the abuse is what actually gives the abuse power to live in her, and we can safely conclude that her thoughts and actions have hurt as their father. With this in mind, we can look at what John 3 talks about in connection to the born-again experience. It's really important to understand this concept, for we will not be able to see nor enter the kingdom of God unless we are born again. Let's read John 3, 1 through 16. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that that we know, and testify that we have seen, and ye have not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how will you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again to understand all that Jesus taught. Nicodemus was a man who owed his birthright to Judaism and obedience to the commandments described in the law. The way he was reasoning was determined by a Jewish worldview. The Gentiles are sinners and the Jews are the light bearers of the world. Salvation is deliverance from political oppression. Justification comes by obedience to the law. Money and blessings are a sign of your obedience to the law. The Jews are the people of God. Man is the servant of God and can never be at the right hand of God. The list goes on. Jesus explained to Nicodemus how he could be born again and have a brand new foundation from where God's reasoning could give birth into a new life in him. He explained that the Son of Man, the representative of mankind in their sin, and as a man under the law representing the law, had to be lifted up as a snake was lifted up in the desert. He went on to explain that those who believe in what actually happened in the Son of Man when he was crucified as the law man and the sin man will be saved. The snake represented the doctrine of the devil, the satanic system of legalism and works righteousness, in which a person sees good works as the only way to have eternal life. A new birth would be to see the law system and the death it brought die on the pole just as people live when they looked at the snake dying on the pole. 
Similarly, when you see Jesus, a man under the law, representing the lawman and carrying all sin of people, dying on the cross, and see that in his death you are no longer under the law, nor are you a sinner anymore, you have received the new birth. All who can see Jesus on the cross have come to the conclusion that the law is not the light of the world and that man stands forgiven of all sin. Having this conclusion as the foundation of your thinking opens your eyes to the kingdom of God. You are now open to the relationship of doing things which is portrayed in Elohim. As we, have, as we see this death, we find a new logic and enter into a new platform of reasoning. From this platform, we can understand the kingdom of God and even enter into its power. We will no longer owe our financial standing to the law and willpower. The power derived from our newfound reality, which is based in truth, will be the source of our new life. It will be impossible for us to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness if we are still clinging to the concept of traditional financial principles. As long as we cannot see the sowing and reaping system and tithing crucified, lifted up as the snake was lifted up in the desert, it will be impossible to see or enter the kingdom of God in the area of finances. Unless the foundation of our reasoning concerning money is born again by seeing those law systems lifted up as the snake was in the desert, we will not understand or experience what Jesus was talking about in the sixth chapter of Matthew where he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you, unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow will take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof.